Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn about new guidelines aimed to reduce the risk of peanut allergy. My name is Melanie Carver, and I have the privilege of being your host today. I'm the Vice President of Community Services for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Our food allergy division is known as Kids with Food Allergies. We offer families free information to learn how to manage food allergies, including reading label tips, school planning help, and we have thousands of allergy-friendly recipes. Additionally, we offer personalized support on our online support community. If you are not yet a member, we encourage you to register so you can stay up to date on issues relating to food allergies. In today's presentation, we will review what the new guidelines say about introducing peanut-containing foods to infants. This webinar is being recorded, and we will share the recording with you when it is ready. We have a large audience today, and we will try our best to answer your questions. Please take note that we have a preloaded handout for you. You can check your GoToWebinar console on your device to look for the handout. If you're unable to download it during this meeting, don't worry, we'll email it to you later. We also want to remind you that the information shared today is of a general nature only and is not medical advice. We encourage you to talk with your own primary care provider or allergist for any medical advice you seek with regards to food allergies. We have a nice incentive for people in the audience. At the end of today's presentation, there will be a survey. Please fill it out to give your feedback on today's webinar, and we'll randomly draw three winners from those completed surveys to receive a gift bundle from Kids Freely Cosmetics. The packages are valued at around $70 each and include a variety of their allergy-aware products. We'll announce the winners on the Kids with Food Allergies community forums later today. I'm excited to introduce our guest speakers. They are both members of the expert panel of the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Diseases Peanut Allergy Prevention Guidelines. Our speakers are here today as volunteers. Dr. Matthew Greenhaw is a pediatric allergist and co-director of the Food Challenge and Research Unit at Children's Hospital of Colorado and an assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He's the lead author on many studies related to food allergies, and he's been a volunteer medical advisor to Kids with Food Allergies and the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America for many years. Karina Venter is appointed as a research associate and dietitian at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. She is currently the chair of the International Network of Dietitians and Nutritionists in Allergy. She's a registered dietitian in the United Kingdom, United States, and South Africa, and she's the only dietitian that has presentation on U.S. and European food allergy guidelines. Thank you both for joining us today. I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Dr. Greenhaut so that we can get started. So we're going to talk today about the new guidelines. This is something that both Karina and I worked on for, oh gosh, I want to say 18 months or so and a little bit before then. Um, and AFA was one of the coordinating committer, committee members and, and was instrumental in the development of this. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about this. Um, skip and do that. There's that. Wow. That's a <laughs> get you a new picture for sure. Um, so we'll talk about the guidelines today, sort of the rationale for why these were changed and what it can mean for the future of, of peanut allergy. And I, I think we're, we're off on a wonderful journey that really might change the history of where we're going with peanut allergy in the United States and hopefully elsewhere. These are my disclosures. They're numerous. Um, I am a medical advisor for both KFA and for AFA. Um, I am funded through the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research. Um, I'm on the Joint Task Force, a couple of things. Um, and I was a member of the expert panel. What we're going to go over today what are the data that support the new guidelines? How these guidelines were created and why? What are we recommending? What are the risk categories? And how should peanut be introduced based on what your child's risk is? And then Karina is going to go into sort of the types of peanut containing foods and how these should be given to parents. And then we'll close with additional recommendations for potentially other foods that might be ready for early introduction on the horizon. So the rationale for phasing out the old guidelines that recommended avoidance and ushering in the new guidelines that really are recommending early introduction. So what's so special about peanut allergy? I know I'm speaking to a, a group of parents that are probably uh, well versed on the dangers and, and the numbers with peanut allergy. It's a growing public health problem. The prevalence has been estimated anywhere between 1.4 to 4.5% in the United States. 
However, in the U.S., our rates are special. These have not been established by actually putting peanut in a child's mouth and seeing who reacts. They're being uh, estimated by other methods that may have a little bit of an error rate and aren't as accurate as some of the other studies. However, the rates are fairly consistent across the U.S. when you do uh, use non-challenge-based methods. And it seems that using these methods, that the prevalence has doubled in the past year. I'm sorry, the past 10 years. We know that about only one in four kids will outgrow their peanut algae, which makes it, you know, something that we would call more likely to be lifelong than not. We know that peanut gets a lot of negative focus. It's associated with poor quality of life and anxiety. It's got this perception that it's more severe than other allergens, which may or may not be true based on your personal experience and a lot of other things. And it does receive more focus for bands than other more prevalent allergens. Remember, milk and egg allergy are still far more prevalent than peanut algae in the U.S., yet peanut is the one that gets the higher degree of focus. When we talk about where we've been in terms of prevention, before the year 2000, really there wasn't anything that we were saying. We weren't saying avoid this or include that. There wasn't any advice. And it was in 1997 when the, when the United Kingdom and the food, uh, the FSA, um, issued their first guidance that recommended avoidance for three years for things like peanut. Um, the AAP followed suit in the year 2000, recommending that there should be delayed introduction of highly allergenic foods in infants at high risk for allergic disease to prevent the future development of food allergy. Now, these high risk kids were considered anybody with one or two parents who had allergic disease. And the recommendations were to avoid cow's milk until the age of one, egg until the age of two, peanut, tree nut, and fish until the age of three. It also recommended use of hydrolyzed formula for certain high-risk kids and to avoid uh, mothers eating peanuts while pregnant and while breastfeeding. And at the time, there was a small but decent study that had suggested that perhaps this delay was associated with a reduced risk of developing allergies. So that was the recommendation at the time. By 2008, there seemed to be no convincing evidence that was supporting delayed introduction of any food for allergen avoidance. Um, and the AAP retracted that guidelines and issued something new in 2008 saying there's really no benefit to delaying the introduction of any solid food past the age of four to six months of life. Now, this is a passive recommendation saying don't avoid, but at the same time, it wasn't saying please actively introduce X, Y, or Z food at this age to prevent anything. So. At 2008, we were already in a state that said avoidance is old news, but nothing active was being recommended. So uh, for the last eight years, that has been, actually nine years now, that has been the recommendation. Over the last five to six years, there's been more emerging data that suggests that the delayed introduction of complementary foods really actually might increase the risk of food allergy, asthma, eczema, or multiple other things. And it, it really put us on this mission to um, have ideas and have studies that could really show what is best. Should we delay? Should we introduce early? And that's really where we've come to now. So past eight years have said, said that um, there shouldn't be any delay in introduction, but it didn't actively say to do anything. So now we move into the evidence behind a new policy change. In 2008, a really provocative study from Gideon Lack's group in uh, the UK, led by Dr. George Dutoy, compared two large cohorts of kids in Israel and in the United Kingdom. Now, at the time, the kids in, the, in Israel were being given peanut and other foods freely within the first year of life. Most of them, probably 80 to 90 percent, had introduced peanut by age uh, nine months or so. Where in the UK, they were following the Food Standards Agency recommendation to avoid peanut until about age three. So this was an ideal comparison to make to see is there really a difference in the rates of peanut allergy and does it have anything to do with uh, perhaps the timing of introduction. And what they found was that the rate of peanut allergy in the United Kingdom was 10 times higher than the rate in Israel. And they looked within a specific population. It was only Ashkenazi Jewish kids. So these are Eastern European uh, Jewish heritage kids. So uh, very genetically similar. And when they tried to control for all the different variables that might explain why there was this effect, the only thing that was significant seemed to be the timing. Now, this is an observational study. It was survey-based. They certainly weren't giving or monitoring any of these, these rates. It was all sort of uh, questionnaire-based. Um, but it was very provocative, and it seemed to suggest that there was a potential effect here with the timing of introduction. And that inspired the Learning Early About Peanuts study, which we'll refer to as the LEAP study, which was a randomized trial of early versus delayed peanut introduction. So they took 640 kids, divided them in half, and gave half of them peanut early, and the other half they made them wait until five years to see what actually would happen. And they used either Bamba, which is a 
peanut containing puff or peanut butter as the vehicle. In this study, they took infants aged 4 to 11 months that had either one or both very rigorous screening criteria. So the first criteria was having moderate to severe eczema using a standardized uh, scoring system or parental self-report. Or these kids had egg allergy, or of course they could have both. So this was the entry criteria. Then they further screened them to see were they already um, sensitized to peanut. So they looked to see did these kids have high levels of peanut sensitization on skin testing. If their skin test was five millimeters or, or greater, um, they were excluded from the study and they were felt to be already highly likely to be peanut allergic. If they had anywhere from zero to four millimeters of sensitization, then they were further randomized in two groups. And then they split them. They looked at the kids with no skin tests and then they looked at the kids with positive skin tests in parallel. And they split these groups in half um, to either have peanut early starting at four to 11 months of life or to deliberately delay until five years of life. Um, these kids came back for multiple visits during the time. The first introduction of peanut was done in the allergist's office, um, but after that they came back for visits and then at age five everybody came back for a final peanut challenge. So pretty good methods. And what they found was this, and you can see this is in what they call the intention to treat analysis, so the people who were randomized. Um, and what they found was that among those who had no skin tests, among those who avoided, 13.7% developed peanut allergy versus only 1.9% who actively ate peanut early. And that's almost a 12% difference. In the groups with the positive skin test, 35.3% who avoided peanut developed peanut allergy, whereas only 10.6% of those who ate peanut early developed peanut allergy. And when you look at the groups in combination, it was 17.2% versus 3.2% in the consumption group. Those are very, very big effect sizes. The slide is actually cutting this off a little bit, but almost there's almost a 25% difference between the skin test positive and negative group. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in the skin test positive group, and a 12% difference in the skin test negative group, and an overall 14% difference. Putting that in plain English, and it's something called the number needed to treat, how many infants would you actually need to feed peanut early to prevent one case of peanut allergy? And those who had no skin test that was positive, it was eight and a half. That's pretty good. Anything really under 10 is, is very good. And those who had a positive skin test, uh, the number needed to treat was four. So you'd feed four kids to prevent one case. And overall, that averaged out to about 7.1. So this was a, a, a smashing success. This is one of the most successful allergy trials that has ever been done. Um, There's very, very clear benefit for early introduction versus avoidance, both in the group that had no evidence of any pre-existing recognition of, of peanut versus, uh, you know, the kids who... equally in all different populations and that's why we have different doses of medications and you know there are a million different hypertensive medications because everything works a little bit different but this showed that pretty much everybody got benefit from this which is wonderful and the effect wasn't temporary although I'm not showing a slide on this they actually told all these kids at age five to stop eating peanut for another year brought them back and challenged them and they found that there were only three new cases of peanut in, in, in each arm and this is called the leap on study so this, this effect was not temporary this wasn't some transient desensitization or anything this is a permanent and lasting effect so again a smashing success and with that we needed to develop new guidelines um, this took place over an 18-month process, but for those of you who might have seen some of the early literature on this, the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and there was an accompanying editorial written by Dr. Sampson and Dr. Grushala, um, who recommended that we immediately implement this. That these findings were so significant and so beneficial that we couldn't wait, and that we were possibly doing harm by not um, going forth and, and actively changing our management. So, in that period of time, uh, the NIID decided that they were going to sponsor guidelines, and uh, they chose a 26-member panel um, that included physicians, dietitians, parents, advocacy group, uh, as many key stakeholders as possible. We had two in-person meetings and multiple calls, and there was an independent facilitator to help sort of uh, push the discussion along. Whenever we made a recommendation, it required majority approval. Um, and then approval by the stakeholder committee. Uh, and after that, it went back to the coordinating committee, which AFA was part of, which was a, a, another group of individuals basically to double check our work and make sure that everybody agreed. 
And what we were tasked for, what we were tasked to do was to come up with um, a consensus based on a strong agreement that the LEAP results were convincing and that the policy should change. And that was our overwhelming uh, opinion. And what we needed to define was who is high risk, what groups may need a cautious approach, should we be pre-testing these kids as they did in the, in, in the study, could this be done at home, when should we do it, and most importantly, what type of peanut should we use. And when we say peanut, we're not talking about kernels of peanut, which is a choking hazard, we're talking about peanut containing foods. So the first thing that we did was define high risk. And looking at the data, the, the LEAP study was pretty good in terms of their selection, and they even validated these criteria, which made our jobs a little bit easier. And the consensus was that there was really nothing wrong with the LEAP criteria that were used, that kids with severe eczema and kids with egg allergy seemed to be at the highest risk of developing peanut allergy. Now, we've known about these two criteria actually for years. Um, some of you who are watching might have had kids who had moderate to severe eczema when they were younger and were referred to an allergist early on for testing. And that might be how you found out that your child was allergic even before you put these foods in their mouth, either through blood or skin testing. So we felt that severe eczema was definitely a major criteria, but we wanted to be very clear in how this was defined. Severe eczema, what we defined it as a persistent or frequently recurring eczema that had a typical morphology and distribution. So this is a red scaly patchy rash um, that's been assessed as severe by a healthcare provider and really needed frequent prescription strength topical steroids uh, or things like calcineurin inhibitors or other anti-inflammatory agents despite the appropriate use of, of both sort of lotions as well as frequent bathing. So what this is not, this is not your once or twice, one off, two off um, uh, eczema patches. This is not something that came up on your cheek once for a week and went away. These are kids that probably had eczema from day one or week one or month one that never got better despite frequent bathing, what we call here in Denver, uh, the soak and seal method, um, where you're, you're moisturizing the skin, um, you're using everything at your disposal and it's just not going anywhere. And that was universally accepted as a definition. The other definition was egg allergy. Um, now, in the U.S., most kids are not exposed to egg before age six months, but sometimes there are kids that get it early or there's exposure or suspected exposure through other routes. So we define egg allergy as a history of an allergic reaction um, with uh, a positive skin test um, or a positive food challenge. So this wasn't just kids with a positive test. There had to be an actual clinical correlation to it. And then a specialist was somebody who knows what they're doing with skin testing and challenges and knows how to manage the risks. Most importantly, we did change a couple of old risk categorizations. Who was not at risk based on this? Well, infants with parents who have allergies, which is very different than every other prevention guideline in the past where the parental history was really the only risk factor. Also not at risk. Infants with older siblings who have food allergy, including peanut allergy. Infants with any other food allergy beside egg allergy. And infants who don't have severe eczema. And again, these might have been risks in the past, but really not anymore. And that's going to take a little bit of new education, re-education, or de-education, whoever uh, we might be talking to. Because uh, again, these have been things that have been thought of as allergy risks in the past, but for the purposes of peanut allergy introduction, we are moving past that to just severe egg allergy and or, uh, sorry, uh, severe eczema and or egg allergy. And what were the recommendations that we made? So we made three categorizations based on the eczema severity mainly. So in the first group, the highest risk, those with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both, we recommended to strongly consider evaluation by either skin or blood testing, and if necessary, uh, an oral food challenge or controlled introduction in the, um, in the provider's office. Based on, this, on the testing results, uh, that would dictate whether or not we felt that peanut introduction would be recommended, and we're recommending that this could begin as early as four to six months of life. The second group were those with mild to moderate eczema, and they could have peanut-containing foods freely introduced around six months of life. There was really no consensus that these kids uh, needed to have this done in the doctor's office or needed any pre-testing. The third group were kids with no eczema or any food allergy. And just like the second group, they could also introduce peanut-containing foods. And we were a little bit less, uh, less certain about you know, whether that had to be specified around six months of life. Um, that could just happen with natural introduction at an age-appropriate time and in accordance with your family preferences or cultural practices. So um, in this, what we mean is 
first, like any other child, you're always going to your pediatrician or your primary care provider anyways at, you know, a couple of weeks of life, at a month, two months of life, and four months of life. You should be having these, these discussions with your pediatrician or primary care provider at, that, at those time points about what's going to happen. And we call that anticipatory guidance. So your provider should be talking to you about the next two to three months and what's going to happen with your baby. And right around four to six months of life is when most solid foods are recommended to be introduced anyway. So this isn't changing sort of the natural history. We want something other than a peanut containing food to be your first food. Try something like a, a grain cereal or a fruit and vegetable. You're switching from either breastfeeding and or bottle feeding, uh, which is all liquid based to something now that is solid, that has a different texture, it takes different muscles to suck, swallow, and coordinate. It's something that the baby has to get used to. So we don't, we didn't want peanut to be the first food where God forbid the baby might gag or choke on something just out of just naivete, not knowing how to handle that sensation or texture in their mouth. And that gets confused with being an allergy. So give your child a couple of different foods first, but then within this time period, move on to peanut. The algorithm for the group one um, is a little confusing, albeit, um, honestly, this was the simplest form, and, and Karina can attest to that. There were a number of different uh, things that went up on the drawing board. Um, but it was felt that either the blood test or the skin test could be used. Now, there was a strong preference that the skin test and the evaluation at the allergy specialist was the preferred route. And that's great if you live in an area where there's easy access to an allergist. That does not represent all of the United States, and we were well aware of that. Also, some kids with eczema might end up at the dermatologist first, or you know maybe the eczema wasn't that bad and the primary care physician might be able to do something to help sort of decide who really needs to come to see the allergist. Now, there are only 5,000 of us in the country uh, and there could be potentially 800,000 kids born with eczema each year. So a little bit of mismatch in terms of capacity. So um, running the blood test at the primary care physician was felt as a way to maybe reduce the burden of kids who come to us. If the blood test is negative, your likelihood of having a peanut allergy is really, really low. And it was recommended that peanut could be introduced at home. If there was a strong pro provider or parental preference to have this done in the office, they could be referred to us for further evaluation. If the blood test was positive, we wanted them referred to the specialist. At the specialist, uh, if we felt that skin testing was uh, indicated, we would run that. A negative skin test, which is anywhere from zero to two millimeters. Again, this is associated with a very, very low likelihood of having a positive uh, peanut allergy. Um, and it was felt that um, we could recommend home introduction. At three to seven millimeters, which is a mild to moderate size skin test, this is where we felt we should be a little bit more cautious in this high risk group. And we should either do a supervised open feeding, just feed the kid in the office, or do a graded uh, approach like we would with a food challenge where we get a little bit and then a little bit more. So the option was open. At eight millimeters, we thought that the evidence was probably more likely than not uh, pointing towards uh, a pre-existing peanut allergy. And it was felt that at this point, we should probably put a hard stop and really only if there are overwhelming circumstances or a very, very strong provider or parent preference that this is where we, we should just manage them as if they're peanut allergic um, and see them back. So a little bit of a confusing algorithm, but if you think about it, we're doing some testing. If the testing is too big, we're taking a very cautious approach. If it's sort of, and I don't mean to make a Goldilocks uh, analogy here, but if you, you know, sort of in that moderate range, we could do the, the skin testing and the, and the introduction in the office. And if it was no, no positive skin test, we could send you home to do it. So in this scenario, still most kids are getting peanut introduced early. It's very important that this middle group here not be ignored. I think the, not, the, the, um, you know, the, the bias is, well, you got a positive skin test that might really indicate a, a dangerous signal. Um, yes and no. If you look at the data from the LEAP study, these kids actually receive far more benefit than these kids, and it would be an important group not to overlook. That's where you're doing more benefit, and that's also something that I think we're going to need to sort of de-educate a lot of the allergy providers to sort of buck the notion that these kids are at risk. You're doing it in your, op in your office. Um, it's a fairly safe procedure, and we should go for it at that point. So what to take away from this? And I know I'm going over a lot of material very quickly, uh, and, and I do apologize for that. But um, the number one thing, try and tolerate a couple of different typical baby foods first. Early introduction is being recommended for all infants. Again, if you have any range of eczema and or egg allergy, we're still recommending uh, at, at least a trial of this. It's only those with the severe eczema and or egg allergy that have very, very large skin tests where we're withholding this. 
But for everybody else, and that should represent the far vast majority of infants in the U.S., we're recommending early introduction. So it's near universal. It's just a little bit cautious in a certain group. And again, most of these kids can have this done at home. Really, only this small percentage are high risk and need the extra caution of having it done in our office. Most importantly, use an appropriate peanut-containing food. Please don't give your baby a whole kernel of peanut. Your baby will probably choke on that. That, that is common sense. And again, we're saying peanut, but we're meaning peanut-containing food. And Karina is going to go over this. Um, she was instrumental in writing a lot of the recipes in the guidelines. Um, a lot of parents have asked us, well, do we do anything different with peanut? No, this is just like giving your child any food. They're probably going to spit it out, or if they're like my kids, they're going to take the spoon of the bowl and dump it on the floor, and you'll clean up a mess, and, and that's great. That's what kids are supposed to do, but this is like any other food. We're just telling you to introduce it early. We need to move away from this stigma that this is so-called dangerous. The research has proven that it likely is not and could actually be quite beneficial. Um, you know, we want you to watch the kids for, you know, give a little bit of the first 10 minutes, watch them carefully, and then move on. But really, this is just like feeding your child any other food. Um, you want them to have this in their diet regularly, but again, your child is in charge, and you're going to find they may like certain things more than others, and they might eat it a couple of times and then decide, I'm done, I don't want this, and that's okay. As long as they didn't react, your child is not allergic. If you can get it into them on a regular basis, two grams three times a week was the recommendation, um, that's fantastic. But if you can just get it into their diet regularly, I mean, again, use common sense. It's a, I like it. It's a great, I just actually had a bagel with peanut before I came on here. Um, it, it's a great tasting food. It's very, very nutritious, and it is a staple of the American diet. So as regularly as you can get it into their diet, go for it. Um, and if you suspect a reaction, please seek immediate medical attention. In the LEAP study, most of the reactions were mild and on the skin. I know that there's some concern that this child is nonverbal and can't tell you that they are uh, not feeling well. Again, you'll start to see subtle things if your baby becomes withdrawn a little bit more cuddly, uh, they start to cough, gasp, or vomit. I mean, a lot of these things won't be so subtle. They'll be very obvious. But again, um, most of the kids that did react did have skin symptoms. So uh, now that might not be every child in the United States who undergoes this, but the, by, by and large, um, this is what is predicted to happen. Let's talk about other foods. So the one question that we've all been asked on the guidelines is, well, what about anything else besides peanut? So there was a recent meta-analysis, which is a fancy name for taking a bunch of studies that have been done and trying to pull the data together to get sort of a, a, a summarized conclusion. So the UK Food Standards Agency sponsored this review. They went through 16,000 titles, identified 51 studies that looked at the risk of developing allergy from early introduction. And what they found is there was moderate certainty of evidence from five egg trials that introducing egg at four to six months of life was beneficial. And it translated to about a 44% lower risk of developing egg allergy. In plain English, that's 24 cases of allergy prevented per 1,000 kids who get introduced to egg. To me, that's great. That's 24 less kids that I have to see in my office. And I think all allergists would applaud that. That is significant risk reduction. With peanut, based on two trials, there was a sister trial to LEAP called EAP. Um, that also showed uh, some benefit from early peanut introduction. Um, they also found moderate certainty of evidence and a 71% lower risk, translating to 18 cases per 1,000 children. So again, um, if you look at, and this is the fancy thing called a forest plot, basically this is your line here. Um, a a study is considered significant when it doesn't cross this line, and these are the odds. So you can see most of these cross but when you did the pooled effects for egg allergy, it didn't cross. And on this side, on the left side, that's associated with protection. On the right side, it's associated with um, uh, harm. Um, and, and really, the, the overall effect was quite beneficial. Same with peanut. Um, with milk allergy, there really hasn't been very much done with this. But I, I, you know, we're looking in the direction that egg is probably the next step. Now, uh, this study, this is a Japanese study, was just published in December in a journal called Lancet. Uh, which is one of the foremost medical journals in the world, and it showed a smashing success for reducing the risk of egg allergy. Um, and that, that's really, you know, it, it actually, I think it was more successful than the LEAP study. So we're moving in this direction, but where we were with the guidelines at the time that we had to make a decision, we opted not to go for anything else but peanut. Hopefully that will change in the future. We will see. I think that there certainly is uh, good evidence that we're moving in that direction. So with the recommendations, again, the final slide, and I'm going to yield, I've probably taken up too much of Karina's time already. Uh, introduce peanut early. It seems to work for all infants, no matter what your risk is. Um, 
avoidance and this delay, that's old news and the wrong strategy. There is absolutely no benefit to delayed introduction for any food past four to six months of life. And that's been in accordance since 2008. Again, with our avoidance, with I mean, sorry, with our um, introduction of peanut, again, we're going to have to monitor this going forward to see how it's working. But if everybody buys in and providers and parents are willing to go along with these new research findings, we can prevent literally tens of thousands of cases of peanut allergy a year. That would be fantastic. I, I see a lot of peanut allergy cases. Uh, you know, even one less case a day would be fantastic. I think all of us would applaud that. We would easily find something else to do with our times. And you think about that, you stop peanut allergy, you stop all these other things that happen once you have peanut allergy, the poor quality of life, the anxiety, the restrictions. Think about how many wonderful things could be prevented. Think about that. And that's really uh, why we all need to pitch in. It just is associated with such an overwhelming, wonderful benefit. With egg, the data are a little bit more difficult to interpret, not as clear as peanut, but the trend is certainly promising. We're not quite there yet. But again, go back up to this. No benefit to delaying anything past four to six months of life. We just don't have a recommendation that says introduce it at this age and it's associated with a clear benefit yet. But I do think that that is coming. Again, the saga is going to continue here, but early introduction seems to be of great benefit. And remember, even though this is going to help, there is no one single cause of food allergy. And my last message is for those of you out there who might have avoided peanut because that was the recommendation or didn't do this or that, please understand and listen to me. Nobody caused peanut allergy. It was something that was going to happen. And I've been talking to a number of parents and other experts and done a lot of interviews on this. And this is a question I've been asked consistently. This was nobody's fault. This was the best data at the time. There seems to be better data now, and we have changed the recommendation, and that is called medical progress. Again, there's no single cause, and your avoidance did not necessarily cause that. I know that there have been some parents who have felt guilty about that, and um, that that I, I, I'd love to give you a big hug and tell you it's not your fault, but it, it really is not your fault. Um, but moving forward, what we can do now is buy in and do something that has proven benefit, and hopefully we can change the paradigm of food allergy uh, in the U.S. So I'm going to turn it over to Karina now. So thank you for um, inviting me to present here today. Um, so I, my disclosure is that I do consultancy work and I've provided lectures for Deneau, Nestle and Me Johnson Nutritionals. So um, just I think the, the most important takeaway point that I would like to make today is that do remember that prevention does not equal management. You know, in terms of prevention, it's now all talk about giving the allergens, but when we are managing food allergies, then of course we have to still follow individualized avoidance, which may mean total avoidance for some food or perhaps, uh, you know, allowing baked milk or baked egg for some children. So really, you know, Avoidance, I always say, and prevention and management is like two different worlds. Um, it's like really moving from the Isle of Wight to Cincinnati. It's two, two different places. So um, today I will focus a little bit more about the practical aspects of weaning or solid food introduction. And um, I do like this paper by Stefano Holy, which was published in 2014, where we actually showed that about 73% of infants are eating solids in the US by six months of age. So it doesn't seem as if solid food introduction is particularly going to be a problem. However, when we actually looked at the number of children at that stage in 2014 that were eating the allergenic foods by six months, we actually found that no infant was eating peanut or egg by six months of age. And so we can see that if we want to actually instruct parents now or ask parents to introduce peanuts earlier and perhaps egg as well, that you know we're going to have to change how people are weaning in this country or introducing solid foods to a great um, extent. So then just talk about the practicalities of peanut um, introduction. I know way back initially when um, you know they were planning the LEAP study, we were quite concerned about dose, we talked about sodium content of food or salt content, we talked about sugar content. Um, but basically, you know, just to summarize what the final dosages looked like, and remember that is two grams of peanut three times a week, that would be 21 sticks of bamba or about two thirds of a bag, which weighs one ounce or 28 grams. 
um, it would be about 9 to 10 grams of peanut butter or about 2 teaspoons. Now as you can see from this picture, we decided that we want to go with 2 teaspoons of peanut butter, um, but you, it could also be 1 teaspoon of peanut butter if you use a household teaspoon which is sort of like round full, um, but, but for the guidelines we decided we're going to stick to um, kitchen measures of, of teaspoons and that's why we went for two. In terms of peanut butter containing cereals, we did not include this in the guideline and I'll explain later on why, but primarily it was also because the peanut protein content of peanut containing cereals are so varied and so one portion may be three quarters of a cup up to two cups depending on the brand and clearly nobody is going to try and feed a four month old or five month old baby two cups of cereal in one sitting three times a week. Then we also looked at peanut flour or peanut butter powder and we looked at the average protein content of a number of the different brands. Again, this may not be exact for every single brand, but we wanted to give you an average. And about 50% of peanut flour or peanut butter powder is protein, so 4 gram will give you 2 gram of, of peanut protein. And again, that sort of like works out to be um, 2 grams of, of peanut um, powder and now I'm trying to um, get rid of this screen so I can see my whole slide um, but uh, and we also looked at the Reese's pieces um, but um, we decided not not to include that in the guidelines so then in terms of um, the nutritional um, composition of, of peanut containing foods I finally got rid of this so if you look at two grams of, of peanut protein that like I said would give you 17 grams bamba 21 sticks two teaspoons of peanut butter um, chopped up peanut pro, um, peanuts and um, two teaspoons of peanut flour and then cereal I gave you the two different brands of cereal so we looked at the sodium content or the salt content of bamba and peanut butter and then we looked at the salt or the sodium content of one portion of cereal and as you can see here that um, if we look at just an ordinary infant cereal puff so something in one of the brand names I didn't want to use particular brand names today you will see that if it is a cereal puff that is developed for young children the sodium content is about 10 milligram, which is less than what you would find in bamba and peanut butter. Just give me a minute, I'm just giving a lecture. And then, um, but if you talk about cereal puffs, something like perhaps, for example, Cheeto puffs or other brands out there, you will find that the sodium content of bamba is actually much less. So really, if we look at what's available in the market and we look at where bamba or peanut butter fit, between infant type cereal puffs and ordinary cereal puffs it's found its place right in the middle of the market so we're not too concerned it's not too high and not too low and I'll show you later on um, what the, um, the nutrition paper showed and the same goes for peanut butter clearly if you are extremely concerned about the sugar and sodium content of products it would be much better to go for something like peanut flour or peanut butter powder and we decided like I said not to list the cereals in the NIAID guidelines because of their sugar and their high sodium or salt content. So then looking at sodium recommendations for infants in this country so the IOM actually said no upper limit of sodium for infants but 1500 for children one to three years of age but actually when we look at what children eat in this country we can see that infants eat about 500 milligram of sodium um, in the first year of life and if we wanted to look at what the European guidelines state they say that you're allowed 100 milligram per 100 kilocalories of product so Bamba has got about 65 so you can again see Bamba peanut butter is right within the European guidelines and if we actually want to look at what happened in the LEAP study in terms of sodium intake you will see that the sodium intake in the LEAP study was higher than the UK um, RNI for sodium it was also slightly higher than the um, adequate intake suggested in the States but it was still for all the ages up to five years of age sodium intake was always lower 
than the upper shave limit. So again, from a nutrition point of view, and again, I, I don't want to waste too much time, but I also looked at the sugar content of the different products. So if we look at the LEAP study, we did not do too bad in terms of sodium and sugar intake, which was the main things we were concerned about at the beginning of the trial. So from a nutritional point of view, the message to parents is it's safe to give these products. Then um, we wanted to make sure that people know exactly how to introduce peanut. So as Matt have explained, in group one or group two, group one most definitely, perhaps in group two, the introduction will be done in office, in which case it will be done in a graded fashion. So this is just a, a visual um, explanation of how this gradual, gradual introduction of peanut will work. But the top dose in every case is going to be the two gram of peanut butter, peanut powder, peanut flour or bamba. And um, if you do it at home, then you will obviously only give the top dose and it wouldn't be done in such a graded fashion. We wanted to make sure that people know that if you use the smooth peanut butter, you have to mix it with hot water and then cool down, or you can mix it with fruit or vegetable purees. Um, the peanut flour or peanut butter powder can be mixed with purees as well. And bamba can be mashed up with water um, or, you know, which can then just be fed as it is, or it can be also be mixed in with um, fruit and vegetables. But I, you know, from a practical point of view, I've had many questions at the beginning of the LEAP study. I think I personally ask more questions to Gideon Lack than other, any other dietitian in the world. And I think that these are also the, exactly the same questions that I get asked by parents. And, you know, so the first thing is we say give peanut early and then the question comes up, but isn't peanut a choking risk? So, yes, it's true, you know whole shell peanut or lumps of peanut butter should not be given. I've got five years on this slide. I know the AAP says four years, but many other countries actually say not up to the age of five. Um, so you can actually give the bamba, you can give smooth peanut butter mixed with hot water and cool down. You can mix it with vegetable purees, which will make it all suitable for an infant to eat. But clearly we're not going to give whole peanuts to um, infants and definitely not children um, under the age of four or five. Then the other question is, you know, why two gram of peanut protein three times a week? Now Matt already um, discussed with you about the <coughs> peanut intake of children in Israel. And so the amount of peanut use in the LEAP study was really based on the median monthly consumption, which was 7.1 gram peanut protein. Um, and that is where they got the two gram three times a week, which is six grams from. But I think the one thing we have to realize is this is the median intake. So sort of like the intake in the middle. Israeli kids don't have peanut allergy. So, you know, eating less than that medium amount and eating more than that medium amount, median amount also seems to work for children. And we shouldn't be too focused on that exact two gram peanut protein three times a week. So does it have to be weighed, you know? So um, it was interesting when we um, first started to work on these guidelines, and I have to say that many of these protocols are also included in the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology guidelines on how to do a peanut protein, um, peanut challenge. I work very closely with Marian Gruch and the dietitian from Mount Sinai, and I was very much relying on grams of food and grams of peanut protein, whereas Marian really wanted to make it much more practical in terms of, you know, measured teaspoons. And so we felt, found a compromise by actually including both in, in the NIAD guidelines and also in the um, Quad AI guidelines. So, you know, no, these amounts do not have to be that exact, but it's a good way of visualizing how much you're trying to get into the child. You can just count the Bamba Buffs, you know, which is 21 sticks, or you can just give about two, two thirds of a bag. You can just use two flat teaspoons of peanut butter, but a rounded full teaspoon measure is probably fine as well. And then the same with the peanut um, flour or the peanut butter powder. So, you know, what if the child doesn't want to eat the whole amount of food? So Matt has already explained to you that he thinks his kids would have chucked it on the floor my kids probably would have just ate halfway through the bowl and then had enough. You know, 
it does not matter. We just don't know if smaller amounts or less frequent feeds will be as protective against the development of allergy. But from Israeli data, we think it's going to be fine. You know, the LEAP authors, and I've, again, you know, I have to say thank you to Mary Feeney, the dietitian at, um, of the LEAP study, who's always happy to answer my questions and work with me on things. Um, you know, Mary will tell you, the kids got ill. Sometimes they didn't eat the food, but that's fine. Once they're better, just start introducing the peanut again and really focus on regular intake. You know, babies get ill, babies get diarrhea, babies go off their food. Um, this will happen. Um, what if the child wants to eat more? You know, I'm sure every mom or every parent can tell you how one child was a very difficult feeder and how the other child just absolutely loved food and would just eat no amount of food. So some kids are good eaters, you know, some kids love peanut. If they want to eat more, it's fine. Even in the LEAP study, children ate a range of peanut protein rather than one exact gram. You know, what about the foods? But should we feed only the food suggested by NIAID guidelines? I've just tweeted um, a link for more recipes, including other foods than just the ones in the NIAID guidelines. No, you know, you can mix and match the powder, the peanut butter diluted or mix with fruit and vegetables. You can even crush the bamba. That is what one of my um, Israeli colleagues told me at work. Is She said, we crush the bamba, we mix it up with fruit and vegetables. So. There are many different ways. You can cook uh, or bake low sugar cookies or muffins. Again, I've posted some recipes about that and I, I tweeted that as well. But you know, if all else fails, any dietitian can help you to calculate the peanut protein content of a product. So, you know, do, do speak to them. And then the other question I often get is, does it have to be exactly four months? No, you don't need to set the clock. Look for cues of developmental readiness. Um, some babies are breastfed, happily breastfed till five, six months, no interest in food. Work with the baby, work with the family. And then just, I know that we're running out of time, but for the sake of the other allergenic foods, like Matt said, we have got no answer. You have this as a handout. I just wanted to give you some ideas of introducing the allergens, should you and your physician decide that it's a good idea to go ahead with these. You don't have to give bread to give wheat. The pasta spirals are fine. You can do hard boiled egg, it's about a third of one. You can do some cooked fish or you can even use tinned or canned fish. Tahini is a good way of getting sesame in. And then cow milk can be given as a small pot of yogurt. So um, LEAP study showed us, this is my final slide, that the kids grew well, they didn't become overweight, there was no difference in weight, height, BMI between the kids eating peanuts and those not eating peanuts. It didn't um, negatively affect breastfeeding, we're getting back to that. Protein intake, fat intake was slightly higher, they eat slightly less carbohydrate, but I think we are just at the beginning to understand how proteins and fat interact with the immune system. Um, sodium intake was a bit high, but I discussed that in detail. And there was no difference in fruit intake, but interestingly, the kids in the active group that were eating peanuts ate less sugar and cookies. Um, and the LEAP study showed us that an intervention like this can work. You can get to eat peanuts regularly, kids to eat peanuts regularly, but that was done by heavy input of dietitians. That's perhaps something we need to think about. So really, in conclusion, LEAP showed us that we can prevent peanut allergy. There may be some children that have to go testing before they can eat peanuts. Introduction can take place in the office or it can take place at home. There's a variety of different sources of peanut protein and the degree of adherence to the dose and the timing of introduction really will depend on the infant and the family. So I hope we've given you some answers um, and um, I think now is going to be the time for questions. So um, I have Thank no you. idea how to change you back to being the presenter. Oh, I can do that. Thank you, Karina. So thank you both for the wealth of information you presented. Uh, we do have a lot of questions from the audience. We'll see how many we can get through in the minutes that we have left. Uh, the first question is regards to the relationship with egg allergy. So can you explain more about the egg allergy connection and how would someone know if their infant has an egg allergy before they introduce peanuts? 
Uh, well, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the most accurate way is, is by your child having a, a, a reaction to eggs, so it gets a little bit more difficult here. Um, kids with severe eczema, you know, often are tested for food, so you show egg sensitization um, as a potential uh, cause of the eczema or a precursor to food allergies. So I imagine that some of these kids have high levels of egg sensitization that might be considered as egg allergy. The guidelines are shying away from that definition. But some parents, uh, you know, some, some, some mothers might have eaten egg and, 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 and attribute sort of a, a reaction through breast milk or whatnot, or some kids are frankly just given egg early. Um, I think far less kids will fall under that, uh, that category. Um, we're not advocating introducing egg early, but again, right now we're also not advocating delaying anything being introduced between four to six months of life. So um, there's not a real good answer for sort of when you should introduce egg or not. The interesting thing is that egg allergy and peanut allergy track together for whatever reason. There's no biological reason why these two things should be related, uh, but kids that have egg sensitization and egg allergy often do develop peanut allergy and vice versa. So we've known for years that these things tend to clump together, which is why they were pretty good, well-identified risk factors. So, Karina, do you have anything you want to add on that? Or? No, I think... Um it is the problem. It, it, they go together, but it's always complicated by whether the kid have eczema or not, which which is really why these kids probably need to have a good workup by an allergist or a physician before weaning, you know, advice can be given. Okay. So another question we received. My first child has peanut allergy. How do I safely introduce peanut-containing foods to my baby without putting my toddler at risk? I worry about baby drool and shared toys. Do you have tips on how to carefully introduce peanut foods into our home? Um, so, I mean, you, you, you obviously want to be cognizant, you know, especially with small kids. I think the biggest risk is putting their hands in something where there might be peanut dust or whatnot and then going to the mouth or something like that. So, yes, you want to wipe down things. But... Um, I think it's important to understand that there's there's no you know the, the data have, have have changed about sort of what the risk is from the older sibling to the younger sibling, um, and there doesn't seem to be much of a risk. Um, and we we thought about this question long and hard when we were making the guidelines. How many parents would be afraid to introduce peanut early to their younger kid? Um, I mean, I, I think it's important that it's done. You, you just have to be careful. You need to wipe things down, maybe bring the child to a different part of the house or some, some area where it can be a little bit more contained. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that it's hard to sort of specifically address that for each and every parent who might be in that situation. But I, I, I think it can be done. Um, you know, wash with soap and water, wash with commercial detergents. That would be my best advice. Yeah, I think really the, the point here to make for mothers is that any any good cleaning with hot water and soap will get rid of allergens, and they should be very reassured that if if the kitchen is clean, you know, they probably got rid of, of the allergens. Okay, thank you. Does eating peanuts while pregnant count as early exposure for the baby? Um. No, because the baby's not eating peanut. There, there is some transfer. Um, certainly, you know, you, this can be a route, you know, of suspected peanut sensitization. Um, but the data are quite unclear what exposure during pregnancy does. Um, the latest study was by the Harvard group um, in 2014, published in JAMA Pediatrics, that showed that eating peanut during pregnancy was actually beneficial in terms of preventing uh, later onset peanut allergy. There was an earlier study uh, by the COFAR group um, in 2010 that suggested that it might be harmful. So there's no clear evidence. I, As a male provider, the last thing I want to do is tell a pregnant mother what they can or cannot eat, especially if I do not have good evidence. That is just a good way to get into trouble. You might think that it's doing some good, but if you don't have clear evidence, you, you don't know what you're letting out of the bag there. Um, so I, I would never tell anybody not to eat it unless I had a really, really good reason not to. So no, it's not early exposure. And no, I personally don't think it's particularly harmful. But um, 
whether or not this is a necessary cofactor going forward. I mean, this is this is one of the things that wasn't that wasn't addressed in in the, um, or at least it wasn't released yet. In there, they have massive data on that. They might have actually asked this about how much peanut was eaten during pregnancy, and if that interacts with later, then the uh, you know if the kids uh, then eat peanut early. So. Um, no, it's not early exposure, but you know, I, my guess is that it either makes no difference or it's a benefit. Karina, what would you? Yeah, I, I think pregnancy is a complex um, area to address in terms of allergy prevention. Um, I think you know we shouldn't focus just on allergens. It's it's the whole issue of healthy eating in pregnancy. We know there's some epigenetic changes taking um, place. Um, so if I am allowed to say, we have just had a paper accepted in pediatric allergy and immunology discussing nutrition in pregnancy and allergy prevention, and it's going to be in the March issue, so um, I will definitely tweet it, but that actually gives an overview of all the complexities of maternal diet and allergy prevention. Uh, I know this was mentioned earlier in the presentation, but I think it would be a good uh, refresher. What are the signs that people should watch for of an allergic reaction in an infant who can't communicate? Sure. So your time frame for this is very important. This is going to happen within minutes to about two hours. That's your most likely window for an allergic reaction. And what you could see is variable. Most of these reactions will probably have some involvement of the skin, so a rash, uh, hive-like rash, eczema erythema, the child may claw at their mouth or something like that. Uh, they may choke or, or, or gag, but again, choking and gagging are not necessarily specific. But coughing and wheezing would certainly be specific, as would vomiting. Um, also, they may become quite withdrawn, and you'll notice a big behavioral change in them from just the 10 minutes before. Uh, so it's kind of hard to specify. If you look at the appendix to the NIAID-sponsored guidelines, there's actually a, a very nice rendition of the danger signs that we agreed upon uh, would be the most likely things that your child would see. But again, this is this is not medical advice. This is the hard part in a, a national webinar saying what you should or shouldn't look for. I, I don't know. I mean, your child could present with variable things. I think most of these kids are going to tolerate it just fine. But um, those symptoms that I mentioned certainly would be things that I would worry about. And if you see them, seek medical attention immediately, please. Okay. And. Will introducing foods early cause my baby to give up breastfeeding? I wanted to nurse for at least a full year. So we know from the LEAP data that um, early introduction of, of peanut, at least, you know, did, did not affect breastfeeding. So post-randomization, the um, active group continued breastfeeding for 4.7 months, and the control group continued breastfeeding for 4.9 months. So it was very similar. So you know, um, the majority of the kids were recruited into the study at 4 to 11 months. If you add another 5 to 6 months onto that, you get close to 1 year of age. So I, I wouldn't be concerned about, about that based on the LEAP data. Okay, so we have reached the top of the hour. Um, I know we were not able to answer all of the questions, so what we will do is we'll continue to develop materials and, and share resources for our audience in the coming week on this topic. Um, thank you very much to our speakers for volunteering your time and expertise with us today. We really appreciate your efforts to improve the lives of people with food allergies, so thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I, Thank you. So I also wanted to share um, how people in the audience can get involved in food allergy research. Patients and caregivers play a bigger and more critical role in research now. And we'd like to share with you that ALPHA has built a system to engage patients in the research process. We've launched a patient-centered food allergy reg registry. It's the first and only of its kind. It gathers data focused on the real-world experiences of people living with food allergies. What it will do is it will enable us to organize and amplify the voices of the 15 million Americans living with food allergies, giving families an important role in research that can lead to improved treatments and ultimately a cure. The information you share in the registry will help us understand what's most important to people with food allergies and help us improve the quality of life for families managing food allergies. So by joining the registry, you can also help influence the type and focus of research that, of the studies that are conducted so that they are focused on health topics that are most important to you and your family. 
The registry is an online portal hosted on our Kids with Food Allergies website. You can participate at your convenience from the comfort of your home. Once you're registered, there are research surveys for you to participate in. In this patient registry, you manage and control your own data. You can go to research.kidswithfoodallergies.org and click Start Now to join the registry today. And then that's the same method that you use to return as a participant to continue to participate. We will send you this link in our follow-up email after this webinar. Thank you all for joining us today, and don't forget to fill out your feedback survey.